My name is Trevor Noren, Investment Communications Strategist with Wellington. For 40 years, Future Themes has been instrumental in shaping the firm's long-term investment outlook. The question at the heart of the initiative has been a constant. What are the trend lines that will define markets, societies, and economies over the next five to 10 years? Future Themes leverages the firm's breadth of expertise to find answers and deliver actionable insights. The research is done, and now it's time to present. We kicked off with a sit-down with Dara Dunn, the leader of this iteration of Future Themes. He and I discussed the architecture of the research effort and the key insights from each of our four areas of focus, the four S's, sustainability, systems, society, and science. Over the last two weeks, we drilled down into our first two S's, sustainability and systems, Today, we tackle the third, society. From digitization to automation, technological progress has already disrupted how we work, how we play, and how we educate ourselves and our children. Yet, as Future Themes research attests, we are only in the early innings of this digital transformation. From the young to the elderly, what comes next? It's a question that is not only vital to future investment returns, but how we live our lives. Luckily, we've brought together an incredible collection of experts to offer guidance. With that, I'll turn it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Trevor. My name is Caitlin Hollybone, and I'm a relationship manager from the Wellington Client Group based in Sydney. Joining me today, is Santiago Milan, a global macro analyst who leads our efforts in thematic analysis and sector-based research in China and Asia more broadly. Also David Reed, a fundamental equity research analyst focused on emerging market stocks. And finally, Anita Killian, a fundamental, also a fundamental equity research analyst and portfolio manager who leads our Asian technology team. Thank you all for joining us today. We are very excited to talk to you about society, which was one of the four main categories that bubbled up through Wellington's Future Themes project. Santiago, David, and Anita are representing the research team, which explored the future of the society category by examining the future of work, the future of leisure, and the future of self. We're going to explore each of these streams through the lens of a diverse set of personas. Firstly, a 20-year-old living in emerging markets, then a 45-year-old living in developed markets, and finally, through the eyes of a retiree living in China. Anita, can you talk us through how you and the broader research team decided to approach the research through these personas and how they were chosen? Sure. So I guess, you know, we were a pretty diverse group of people and <clears throat> it was pretty clear that we understood that the future of society would pretty, be pretty non-homogeneous. And so we wanted to capture that through representations of people who we could relate to. And so, um, so that was sort of how we came up with the idea of archetypes. And then in the concept of an archetype, you really wanted to encompass a broad swath of society. And so we tried to be very comprehensive with how we tried to cover all the bases. So gender, geography, age, et cetera. And I think, you know, we really leaned in the direction of emerging markets because that's where all the people are. So there was a very strong emphasis on that. And then from, I was on the senior citizen group and the way we approached the research was really to take all of the contributions that we, people at Wellington gave us, all their ideas, and then cull through those and try to map those out into um, a story around Fang, our senior citizen in China. And it was really a amalgamation of many people's ideas that were combined to create a scenario that might be realistic. And then the research on top of that was really trying to go into the current state of the research in the world that by professionals in these areas and 
and try to validate that so that we weren't just making things up and writing science fiction because it's really fun to think about the future and it's really easy to fantasize about what might be, but we wanted it to be grounded in some sort of reality. So once all of those ideas were called through, then the work was to try to ground that into some kind of actual tangible reality of what we think will really happen. Thanks, Anita. Um, we might switch gears a little bit now and, and dive into one of the um, investment themes that came out of the uh, young person living in emerging markets. Um, David Reed participated in this uh, research stream, and we um, we wanted, David, to have you talk us through um, the technology-led education theme and how you think we will all learn in the future. Sure. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so, as you said, our, our research focused on what life might be like for a young lady in India uh, in the future. And our work centered around entertainment uh, relationships and education, all things that are pretty fundamental for, for any young person. Um, we quickly realized that education is going to look very different over the next couple of decades. Uh, advances in technology, and by that, and I mean anything from sensors through to video streaming, uh, mean that we're moving beyond digitizing existing processes in education uh, and towards real scalable delivery uh, of education in what are called digital learning environments. Uh, and this has a p the potential to change a great deal. Um, most classroom time is currently taken up with teachers essentially lecturing to students in a broadcast fashion uh, to impart knowledge. Um, and if technology can help deliver that in a more efficient manner, uh, it frees up teachers to concentrate more on activities like coaching, for example, which we know can be hugely beneficial for student outcomes. The other key advance uh, in technology is the area of big data, AI, and other related technologies. Um, that's a big collection of buzzwords, but fundamentally what these allow you to do is manage high levels of complexity uh, in dynamic environments in an automated fashion. Uh, and that's very powerful uh, for application to the field of education, where complexity and responsiveness to individuals have been the biggest obstacles to scaling and automation so far. It does seem like a, a different environment that the um, that we'll be learning in in the future. Is this, you know, as as an emerging markets investor yourself, you know, are you thinking about this as an investment opportunity today, or is this is this only just the beginning? Yes, very, very much. We, we, we think, uh, you know, education is a very unusual space at the moment. It's a, a huge addressable market uh, and it has minimal technology penetration. So we spend about as much on education as we do on healthcare. Um, but the global market capitalization of education stocks is actually an order of magnitude lower than the healthcare sector. Uh, and only about 4% of the spending in education is on technology at the current time. Um, so there's potentially a lot that can change. And what's interesting about now, when we look forward to the future, is that there is also real evidence of an inflection point here. So if you look at the venture capital space, for example, the amount of money being invested in the space has gone up fivefold over the last three years. And we don't think this is just a private market story either. Um, we do think that the existing online platforms are in pole position to establish themselves in this space. Uh, they possess strong development resources, they have expertise in key technologies, and they've also got plentiful access to capital uh, along with entrepreneurial cultures. But perhaps most crucially of all, they've got direct access to the population, and that's going to reduce the customer acquisition cost for them. So they're, they're really in the, the, the sweet spot to, to take advantage of these uh, trends. And is there any particular relevance to this angle um, from the perspective of India? Absolutely. Um, we think the implications of future education technology on emerging markets is going to be uh, much more profound uh, than for developed markets. Uh, and the first point to note is that's where all the growth is. Over the next 30 years, uh, we're going to see about 2 billion more pupils. And the biggest growth is actually going to be in the secondary and tertiary levels of education amongst emerging markets. And then the other thing we have to bear in mind is that the emerging markets are also much more ripe for disruption. This is a big generalization, but the public provision of education services are much weaker in many emerging markets. And the value added uh, through giving greater access to high quality education in a digital fashion uh, can be that much greater. 
Um, but potentially, this is also a really big deal for the world economy. Uh, the last half century has seen a powerful wave of globalization, and that's been primarily concentrated in what you might call blue collar roles uh, related to manufacturing. Um, we're already seeing signs of what I would call white collar globalization taking place. And that should be very good for global growth. Uh, and it should also be very good for the future earnings power of our uh, young lady in India uh, and people of her generation. Thank you, uh, David. We might um, we might come back to this topic when we're talking about the other other personas as education is, is something that's going to touch all uh, all um, cohorts uh, of the population going forward, it looks like. Um, now are the changes in education. Um, now, Santiago, um, if I can, um, I, have, I have a bit of a question for you. As, as a macro investor, can you talk us through some of the themes that permeated across all three personas? Um, I know digitization uh, was a mega theme that stood out um, in the process, um, but any thoughts, um, what it means for labor markets, entertainment from a community perspective would be interesting. Sure. So one of the things that really struck me, uh, I guess, after we did this was how many threads or how many themes were relevant across the geographies and across the cohorts. It seems to me like this is also a future theme in and of itself, a convergence of sorts. And so a long time ago, probably, you know, the young people were very different from the middle age and the older people in what they did, even in what kind of lifestyle they could uh, aspire to experience and the things that they would do in their everyday life. One of these themes uh, David just talked about is education. Education is now relevant across uh, young people, old people, middle-aged people, and also pretty much everywhere. And it's becoming increasingly uh, standardized, as David was was saying. And, and a part of that is that theme that you alluded to, which is digitization. And digitization is something that's been happening for a very long time. I'll reveal a little bit about my age. I remember the moment when I got a digital watch in the late 1970s, and I thought that the world was fully digitized then. What more, how much more could you digitize from that point? Well, it turns out there was a lot. And I think one of the things that we are learned with this is that even though it's hard for us to see there's actually exponential amounts of further digitization to go through. It, it, just as it seems like the world is just a universe of difference in digitization today from what it was in that 1970s episode with my watch, uh, we are going to see increasing levels of digitization across everything that we see from labor markets, where lots of the information and our digital footprints actually help us and our employers have much better matching markets. In fact, one company we were just talking about in one of our uh, morning meetings uh, does just that in China. So the future is arriving already. Uh, there's also digitization of entertainment, uh, entertainment becoming more virtual. And as uh, also the themes alluded, the more digitized things, the easier they are to travel across borders and to travel across different times. Um, and uh, this, of course, though, uh, doesn't come without costs and doesn't create uh, do doesn't come without creating problems, political problems, for example, of uh, increased uh, ability to have information flow across borders. One of the issues that the young uh, person getting an education in India from a global provider might face are political, especially in this uh, type of a world. And finally, uh, the virtualization and digitization of communities. And so, again, our ability to digitize uh, creates uh, communities uh, that are uh, that run across. Uh, many, many different dimensions, uh, not just your neighborhood used to be the community. Now communities are forming around what type of person you are, perhaps what type of cryptocurrency you like, or what type of uh, non-fungible tokens you decide to buy on the virtual marketplaces. So um, digitization, I think, is something that is we really underestimate uh, every time when we think that we have arrived at you know, what is the quintessential digital world just because 
we're doing this kind of a, 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 a an event right now in this digital manner, well, uh, I can't wait to see what the digital events of five years from now even will be like. I think they'll surprise us. Can I chime in here? You know, I think one of the things that's very powerful is that every single person born on the planet today is born into a digital world. And so they are ex accessing the world through a digital format, whether that's a smartphone or even gaming. I mean, I think every single child born today is a gamer. And that just wasn't true when I was born. I mean, I remember Pong and Atari, those were new. <laughs> and so the thing is, the older generations are only partially penetrated and only will be partially penetrated. But every generation after mine is 100% penetrated with dig dig digitalization. It's a tough word to say, as you know, Santiago pointed out. And you know, I think we who are sort of half analog, half digital, don't even have a concept of what that means for how society will operate because we are, we're not, you know, the fabric of our being isn't completely there, but the new generation is and they will push the envelope. And so, you know, so much of what will be normal is sort of novel for us today. And then education will obviously be more like a game. Everything will derive from gaming because it's highly graphical in terms of the way it relates to people and people relate to that. And it creates, you know, virtual worlds, not for the sake of escapism, but for actual practical purposes. So you will have, and they, we already have this, you know, virtual factories that allow you to analyze your factory output and new, you know, um, new innovation in the factory in a virtual way instead of implementing it in reality so that you know what's gonna work. And that kind of thing will just be kind of par for the course. So I think, you know, we're just at the cusp of this and it's, and I guess what was revealing and what Santiago pointed out is that how much didn't matter where you lived or how old you were, you were sort of encompassed in this new reality of digital world. So may, maybe I could jump in and, and add to that. And interestingly, we, we also found that there was a lot of overlap between our work on education technology uh, and our work in the entertainment space, a large part of which was focused on uh, gaming and topics like uh, esports. And a lot of the key technologies uh, are very similar and a lot of the challenges as well. And perhaps that's not so surprising when you realize that ultimately both of these activities are fundamentally about growing mindshare in, in an effective manner. Excellent. Um, you know, I think um, you've all had a chance to flesh out some of this research with other colleagues uh, internally within Wellington. Uh, be curious to understand if there were any areas of pushback that you received from or, or key questions that um, some of the other um, investors within Wellington uh, posed to you all. Well, I think the biggest one is time horizon and how do we translate these ideas into near term investment ideas. And that's always, you know, always the challenge. I guess being a tech investor, you know, I always say tech is the future. So, you know, if you want to participate in some of these themes, obviously technology investment is the way to go. And very simplistically, you know, semiconductors are the heart of everything that we do. So everything that we can do in the digital realm is enabled by the power of Moore's law, which improves our capabilities every year, every two years. And, you know, the interesting thing about where we are today is that the scale of computation and what it can mean for the impact on the world is bigger than it ever was. Because in the old days, you sort of had a, a chip and the chip went in a computer and that's where it ended. But today, you know, the chips don't just go into computers, they go into very high powered servers. Those servers go into data centers and those servers are all connected in a very high bandwidth way so that it doesn't seem like it's separate servers or separate computers, it's one brain. So now you have a whole data center, which is the computational core of your whole um, pro program and, and that's you know the kind of scale we've never seen before so suddenly you can do things you didn't even think was possible and I think that's where you know we haven't even begun to see 
where that can bring us, but some of these ideas we're talking about are the outcome of that. But fundamentally, what are you doing? You're buying chips that go into data centers and that's the foundational infrastructure that allows this future reality to happen. I, I can mention one pushback that uh, I think was very constructive and actually it's a it's a it's a good reminder uh, is you know people asking how much of our future vision was uh, uh, subject to recency bias and in other words we've seen covid uh, covid has made made us uh, forced us to experiment with all sorts of different technologies and it's also forced us to adopt them and live with them. For example, I see that all of us are, well, all of us except for one are doing this from home. Um, and so the question or the pushback is, you know, are you getting a little bit carried away with this digitization, with this virtualization? Uh, is everything virtual simply because you've been on Zoom way too much, uh, way too often? And I think that's a that's a very good pushback. Uh, and my, my 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 observation, and I'd be curious to hear others, uh, is that perhaps that 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 is the case a little bit. But we thought about this a lot, and one of the conclusions uh, that we got to was that this was an acceleration, and not necessarily uh, you know some sort of uh, interruption or, or or some sort of uh, passing thing, uh, and. Uh, that uh, a lot of the this forced experimentation actually is going to uh, bring us to experiment with new things and many other things. And so uh, this was, I would say, an acceleration of the future rather than an interruption with uh, something that's completely different. But with that said, I think it's a it's a it's a good pushback and it's a good alternative view that perhaps a lot of the things that we're seeing, uh, are distorted by what our recent experience with COVID. Well, that, that was sort of why we did the reality check as part of our research, I guess, to try to make sure, again, it wasn't a science fiction novel we were writing, but um, something we were, we were grasping onto something real. Um, and like in our, in our area, one thing that wasn't digital at all that we talked about and we analyzed was food and you know, the food supply and what does food look like? And then the overlap with health monitoring and health um, analysis and people's better grasp of their personal you know, health, daily health, and how you, you know, the overlap between you know, that information and the food supply and how you can sort of optimize the outcome there. And, and that, so that's, a, you know, there's a digital angle, but really food isn't digital. So, um, but we had to, you know, we had to actually go and figure out, well, what are people actually doing about food? Excellent. You know, a lot of what we've talked about has, um, you know, as we think about the future of how society operates, there will be some um, questions raised around the role of governments going forward um, and uh, privacy policy, et cetera. Is there anything, um, Santiago, you wanted to add from that angle? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one one of the things that about our research is that uh, we did come up across, I would call it those uh, stumbling blocks, and that's really what I would call them. Uh, I think that that if we had a whole another project to do, but a much more difficult one, it would be to think about those governmental and regulatory aspects, uh, in, especially as I was saying, in an increasingly globalized world where data can be weaponized, where countries are very suspicious of uh, uh, data moving across borders and of foreigners having access to very, very personal data like things that come up with education or with healthcare or with, you know, if you think about the digitization of our healthcare, uh, all of the DNA and genome data that uh, uh, we're discussing. So I would say that we didn't really uh, touch upon very directly uh, some of these issues, but I think that regulation is uh, some of the most important uh, aspects that, uh, that, 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 that we should think about in this context. Uh, and David, um, would you be able to dive a little bit deeper into some of the investment implications that you and your team um, thought through um, as a result of the digitization of, of education? Uh, sure. So 
um, when we were evaluating the investment opportunities that are available to us today, uh, we spent some time exploring what sort of business models uh, we think might succeed in the education tech space. Um, and as marginal costs trend towards zero, um, there will be an, a strong incentive to aggregate onto large online platforms. And that's something we've already seen with many disruptive tech companies. We, uh, we all search on Google, um, unless we're searching on Bing, perhaps. Uh, and, and most of the world now has a, an account on Facebook, for example. Um, but we think that education procurement is going to remain uh, very complex. Uh, it's going to remain fragmented. And that's because it's driven by multiple interest groups. So you, you obviously have the, the pupil, um, but parents, uh, teachers and government uh, also all have uh, an opinion on how things should be done. So we think this is going to be a winner takes most market rather than winner takes all, as we've seen in some other tech areas. Um, and the companies that will come out ahead will probably either have large home markets or, or business models with uh, international appeal. And that's so they can gain critical mass and sustain the necessary investment, um, because this isn't going to be a capital light business. Um, we also think that uh, so-called 3P business frameworks, uh, which invite the cooperation with third party uh, content providers, for, for instance, um, are going to be necessary to manage the uh, significant level of complexity. Excellent. Well, um, I think we um, might end it there. Um, thank you everyone for spending some of your screen time today with all of us to explore the uh, future themes um, that may occur um, around the future of work, the future of leisure, and the future of self. We look forward to continuing these conversations over time and thank you again. Uh -huh.